Okay, uh, so before I start getting uh, any further into this, do either of you all have any questions about the novel? Or anything that is confusing you in particular? Or anything that strikes you as, um, as weird or difficult to understand? I don't think it's not difficult to understand. It's just like I said, the back and forth and uh -huh. the it's just too many things going on. For me. Okay. So one thing I can do, I think, right away to try to help, figure like because there are a lot of names here. Why don't I draw you a little family tree to show you how people are connected to each other and like what people's real names and nicknames are. And uh, I think that might that might help clear up some confusion. Because this has like that kind of like that Russian novel problem, right? Where there are, you know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of characters, and people call them different things. And so And some of them don't actually have like a formal introduction. It's like you just do the names in there. Yeah. Just and then maybe formally introduces them a little bit later, yeah. But okay, so let's start with the main family here. Right, with the first generation of that family. So what's unusual about this family is that they are not Hindu or Muslim. Right? They're Syrian Christians. Right, so there is a small um, but historically important Syrian Orthodox Christian community um, in southwestern India. So they're part of that. And the first generation of the family that we learn about is the Reverend E. John Ipe, who is also known by the nickname Punyan Kunju. Which in the Malayalam language means um, the blessed child due to an incident that happened to him when he was a kid. And Reverend, right, indicates he is a Syrian Orthodox priest. And his wife is referred to as Alayuti Amachi. Amachi just means great-grandmother. So, her, the, the name, that, and a lot of these characters' names, right, there are not, some of these characters aren't really given personal names. So Amachi is kind of one of these, you know, that it's, it's just, it's great-grandmother. So their children are Shri Benan John Ipe, the former imperial entomologist, who is mostly just referred to as Papachi, right, which just means grandfather, and his sister, Navomi Ipe who everyone in the family calls Baby Pachama. So Papachi is married to a woman named Sashama, who everyone mostly simply calls Mamachi, or grandmother. And their children, Chaco, who is divorced from Margaret Kachama, and their daughter is Sophie Moll. And Moll is a Malayalam word that means girl. So her name is just Sophie Girl. And then their other child is referred to solely 
That's Abu, right? This is not her name. This is just a word that means mother. And Amu is married to Baba, or was married to Baba. They're also divorced. And Baba simply means father, right? Neither of these characters are given names. And their children are the fraternal twins, right? Esthapen, or Esta, and Rahel, who is the perspective character for most of this, right? So most of what we see here, we see through Rahel's eyes. And Rahel is also the youngest person on this chart. Right? We know even though she's a twin, she's 18 minutes younger than Estop. So everything we're seeing, like everything that happens in the novel, is filtered through the perspective of the youngest character. Now, we are also introduced here to um, a small number of other characters, probably the most important of whom, though he hasn't actually really done very much yet, is Belutha. Now, do you all um, remember anything about Belutha from what you read for today? Was it some type of affair? Oh, am I, am I here? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that, that's a little bit ahead, right? Um, we have Belutha works at the pickle factory for the Kuchamas. Um, he is um, very skilled with machines, right? And he's a skilled carpenter. So he maintains the machines at the pickle factory. Um, and he, you know, makes furniture and tables and things like that for the family. But is there anything else that is uh, noteworthy about Velutha, about his social status? Did anybody pick up on this? Why does he have to hand things to members of the family so that they don't have to touch him? Uh, nope. Was clever? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but there's actually a kind of bigger, uh, there's a bigger thing going on here, right? So, are either, are, either, are either of you familiar with the notion of caste in India? Oh, uh, yeah, like the uh, Indian caste system. Yeah. So do you, do you know how it works? Uh, wait, I wouldn't. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, but it's, uh, you know, the top of it is what, the Brahmins? Brahmin? Yeah. The Brahmins are the top caste, and the Brahmins are priests and scholars. And then the, sh it's not the okay, cave, but I think it's like. Yeah. Okay. It's spelled like this. And it is pronounced Kshatreya. And those are like the warriors, something like that. Yeah, so essentially what, like, what that ends up being like is the, like the aristocracy, right? So kind of like in Europe, you know, kings, knights, things of that nature. And then there's the Vaisha. Mm hmm Those are like the common people. Uh, sort of. The, the, the uh, Vaisha, Vaisha caste is really more um, merchants and professionals. So, like, for example, you know, like, you know, a, a banker would be a Vaisha, so would a doctor, right? So would a guy who owns a store, right? And then the, the lowest caste are the Shudra, um, who are common laborers. So there's a definite hierarchy here, right? Mm -hmm. um, that 
originally seems to have been related to like kind of like social what your social function is, and this becomes a system um, like this kind of, these kind of these systems of like enclosed groups, right? Um, and this relates to this idea of love laws that Rahel talks about, right? That you are not supposed to mix with people outside of your own caste. And this seems to apply to other groups as well, right? So for example, among the Syrian Orthodox Christians, they're not supposed to mix much, especially romantically, with people who aren't members of that group, right? So this is, for example, why one of one of the reasons why the family regards Amu's marriage to Baba as a mistake, because he's a Hindu, he's not a Syrian Christian. She married outside the clan, but right? she married outside the group. Um, <clears throat> there are references to this in Midnight's Children as well. You have the um, Homi Katrak, the Parsi uh, film magnate. Right, so the Parsis are a minority religious group in India who also only marry amongst themselves. So, like, there's the, the, uh, the disabilities of Homi Katrak's daughter are blamed on inbreeding. And there are references in this novel as well to um, inbreeding within groups and its possible consequences. But yeah, like, so. The big thing to remember right now here, though, is this idea of love laws and how social class and the social group you belong to determines who you are allowed to mix with, right? By the way, like this is technically made illegal in the Indian Constitution of the late 1940s. You're not supposed to obey these distinctions anymore, but that doesn't mean they simply disappear. Now, Volutha is referred to in a text, in the text, by a word that people typically don't use anymore to describe his caste, or his class, not his caste. He is what is called an untouchable. And untouchables are people who are outside of the caste system, right? They are people who have no caste. So this refers really to, you know, it can refer to anyone who is not a Hindu. It can also refer to those people who are Hindus, but who do work that makes them like can consider it somehow socially polluted, right? So like maybe they're people who, you know, like, who dispose of, of dead bodies um, or clean sewers and things of that nature, right? Um, their work is considered somehow dirty. And so people who have a caste are not supposed to touch them or take anything from them um, or share a meal with them or things of that nature. This is why they, this is where the, the word, un, the term untouchable comes from. The word that is usually considered more politically correct today is Dalit. But this is not the word that Arundhati Roy uses, right? She, she, she uses the old term untouchable. And I think that this is largely for stylistic reasons to kind of refer back to these love laws. Right, that Volutha is someone that members of a high-class Syrian Orthodox Christian family aren't, someone they're not supposed to touch. And notice, too, that this younger generation have just about all married kind of outside the approved clan, right? That Chaco married an English woman, but that ended in divorce. And Amu and Baba's mixed, uh, mixed religion marriage also ended in divorce, right? Did they, um, I was about to come far ahead, but did Rahel get married too? Pardon? Did Rahel get married too? 
Yeah, Rahel is also divorced. Yeah, she married this guy, um, what is it, Larry? Uh, something. Him. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an it's an Irish name. Let me. He's an American. Uh, Larry. 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 I don't know why this didn't stick. I mean, he, he barely seems to. Larry McCaslin. Yeah, they are also now divorced. But <clears throat> there seems to be this kind of history of people desiring inappropriate people with you know within this family, right? Yeah. Like even um, you know baby Kochama, the obese virginal baby granddad or baby grand aunt right how did she get to be who she is why is it that she is still this you know why, you know why is she an elderly unmarried woman hanging out in the family it home it to do why she went to the um, the, covenant, the... the convent yeah yeah she yeah, she she fa she basically failed to become a nun, right? So let's yeah, let, let's kind of look at that for look at that passage for a minute here. All right, where where where? Um, right, page twenty three. Right, when she was eighteen, baby Kochama fell in love with a handsome young Irish monk. Father Mulligan, who was in Kerala for a year on deputation from his seminary in Madras. He was studying Hindu scriptures in order to be able to denounce them intelligently. So she falls in love with, a, with, a, with an Irish priest, right? And the weird thing is how she attempts to seduce this priest, right? Everything about this is backwards. Right, page 24. Right, at first, baby Kachama tried to seduce Father Mulligan with weekly exhibitions of staged charity. Every morning, every Thursday morning, just when Father Mulligan was due to arrive, Baby Kachama forcefully bathed a poor village child in the well with hard red soap that hurt its protruding ribs. Morning father, Baby Kachama would call out when she saw him, with a smile on her lips that completely belied the vice-like grip that she had on the thin child's soap-slippery arm. Morning to you, baby, Father Mulligan would say, stopping and folding his umbrella. There's something I wanted to ask you, Father, Baby Kachama would say. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, it says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Father, how can all things be lawful unto him? I mean, I can understand if some things are lawful unto him, but... So, what's weird about the way that she's trying to get this priest's attention? Well, she's, she's trying to act like she's doing, like, you know, the, like, good deeds, I suppose. Yeah. She's using charity and like some as an in, right? And then using that as an in to ask relatively boneheaded questions about scripture. All in service of her sexual attraction to a celibate man, right? So she's trying to use religion as a mode of seduction. But then when she enters the convent, right, page 25, right, 
displaying a stubborn single-mindedness, which in a young girl in those days was considered as bad as a physical deformity, a hair lips perhaps, or a hair lip perhaps, or a club foot, baby Kuchama defied her father's wishes and became a Roman Catholic. With special dispensation from the Vatican, she took her vows and entered a convent in Madras as a trainee novice. She hoped somehow that this would provide her with legitimate occasion to be with Father Mulligan. She pictured them together in dark sepulchral rooms with heavy velvet drapes discussing theology. That was all she wanted, all she ever dared to hope for, just to be near him, close enough to smell his beard, to see the coarse weave of his cassock, to love him just by looking at him. Very quickly, she realized the futility of this endeavor. She found that the senior sisters monopolized the priests and bishops with biblical doubts more sophisticated than hers would ever be, and that it might be years before she got anywhere near Father Mulligan. She grew restless and unhappy in the convent. She developed a stubborn allergic rash on her scalp from the constant chafing of her wimple. She felt that she spoke much better English than everybody else. This made her lonelier than ever. So, she doesn't join a convent for the usual reason, right? She joins the convent in order to be closer to a man. Some people do that. Yeah. And th this is a man who is clearly an inappropriate lust object, right? But <clears throat> the problem here is that everybody else in the convent is able to get closer to him than she is. So she even kind of shows she fails in this endeavor and ends up going to America and getting that degree in gardening and coming back obese. So <clears throat> the other thing I think is interesting here too is that right, she falls in love with an Irish priest. Now, Uncle Chaco, at a certain point, notes that they are a family of Anglophiles. And let's, look at, like, let's break down the word Anglophile and think about what this literally means, right? So, what is Anglo? What does Anglo refer to? Like, you know, like Anglo Saxon stuff, but I don't really uh -huh. know what Anglo means. Okay, who are the Anglo Saxons? <laughs> 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 uh, so Anglo refers to England or English, right? A reference to the Angles who settled in southern England um, after the Romans left, right? So Anglo. England. Now, a little disappointed about the Anglo thing, so I'm going to assume that you probably don't know what the Greek word philo means, right? P H I L O? Yes, yeah. good, yes. Anglophile, yes, means England lover. And we can kind of see this in both the family's cultural preferences. Right? They seem to have a strong preference for communicating with each other in English. They're fascinated by English and American pop culture. Right? Esta wears his hair like Elvis and you know, likes to imitate the Elvis Presley dance. Um, Chaco studied at Oxford where he was, um, you know, where he was a, a, on a champion rowing team, and married an English woman, and is depressed by his separation from his English family. And we'll talk a little bit about Papachi and his ideas about England and Englishness in a moment, right? But we have a family that they, on the one hand, they love England culturally, right? But many of them also seem to love England and Englishness sexually. 
Yeah, well, I think that you know, there's kind of more to it than that. Right? I think it goes back to this whole idea of hierarchies and subalterns, uh, subaltern status, right? So let's remember for a second. Can we think back for a minute to the definition I gave? The, the, the definition I gave you of subaltern uh, when I was doing your presentation. Oh, God. Anything <laughs> all you remember is social class something. <laughs> My mind wandered off when you said that. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, and write this down. This is going to be important. Okay, so when we talk about a sub subaltern social groups, right, we're talking about social groups that have been pushed to the margins. of a society because of their social status. So if, for example, we're looking at the picture of Hindu Indian society that we painted here, who would the subaltern group be? Think back to kind of like what we just discussed about caste and about Volutha. Volutha rank socially? Very low. Yeah. So as someone who does not have a caste, right? Volutha, compared to other Hindu Indians, right, would be a subaltern. Now then, how would all Indians in, a colo in colonial India, in the British Raj period, relate socially to English people? Who would be the subaltern in that relationship? The Indians would be. Yeah. Just generally speaking, right? Even socially prominent Indians like this family. So, for example, if we look at the reason why uh, Amu got divorced, right? Why did she leave her husband? He was an alcoholic, I know, and then he tried to get her to sleep with uh, yeah. his boss. Yeah, he's, yeah he, he, he's an alcoholic, which is the, the, the initial problem, right? And his English boss is going to fire him from the tea, his job in the tea plantation. But if we look on page 41, Mr. Hollick had been frank with his young assistant. He informed him of the complaints he had received from the laborer, as well as from the other assistant managers. I'm afraid I have no option, he said, but to ask for your resignation. He allowed the silence to take its toll. He allowed the pitiful man sitting across the table to begin to shake, to weep. Then Hollick spoke again. Well, actually, there may be an option. Perhaps we could work something out. Think positive is what I always say. Count your blessings. Hollick paused to order a pot of black coffee. You're a very lucky man, you know. Wonderful family, beautiful children, such an attractive wife. He lit a cigarette and allowed the match to burn until he couldn't hold it anymore. An extremely attractive wife. The weeping stopped. Puzzled brown eyes looked into lurid, red-veined green ones. Over coffee, Mr. Hollick proposed that Baba go away for a while, for a holiday, to a clinic perhaps for treatment for as long as it took him to get better. And for the period of time that he was away, Mr. Hollick suggested that Amu be sent to his bungalow to be looked after. Already there were a number of ragged, light-skinned children on the estate that Hollick had bequeathed on tea pickers whom he fancied. This was his first incursion into management circles. So 
First off, what is, how does Mr. Hollick seem entitled to behave with his employees? But he's not, right? He doesn't give a shit about Baba's health, right? He doesn't give a shit about his alcoholism. He wants to sleep with his wife, yeah. And so, and and this is obvious, even you know, to Baba, right? Like he understands that this is what the proposition is. I don't know if if any of you have ever seen the movie *Indecent Proposal*, right? You know, it's like I'll give you a million dollars for one night with your wife, right? That's kind of what's happening here. But there's also like there's this kind of this this power dynamic that's a part of it as well, right? Why does Mr. Hollick feel like he can behave this way with his employees no matter what their status is, whether they're tea pickers or whether they're management? He's the, the highest caste, basically. Well, how is Mr. Hollick different? Really, from Baba. Um, <laughs> that's not the question. Um, Think about you know, green eyes versus brown eyes. Green eyes are very unique. Well, it'd be, well, it would be pretty unique in India, right? Yeah, and then brown eyes is just very common for people. Well, in India, yes. Mr. Hollick okay. is English, right? As such, he seems to regard all of his Indian employees as his private playground, right? Now, we actually see Chaco engaging in kind of similar behavior when he's running the pickle factory, right? He, you know, calls girls he favors who work in the factory up um, to his office to flirt with them, right? Yeah, it's, it is sleazy, right? It is sleazy, but it's also like it, it's you know kind of behavior that imitates the behavior of these English managers, right? And you know, let's bear in mind too how like does Baba respond to this as though you know like this is something that's way out of way out of bounds? Is like screw you, buddy. I'm gonna screw you, buddy. I quit. Does he say this is the final straw? No. Yeah, he comes back to his wife relieved, right? Mm -hmm. And tells her to do it. Which is why she which is why she leaves him and takes the kids. Yeah. And then when she gets to her Anglophile, when she comes back to Kerala, to her Anglophile family. On page 42, Papachi would not believe her story, not because he thought well of her husband, but simply because he didn't believe that an Englishman, any Englishman, would cover an would covet another man's wife. So <clears throat> her own father is so convinced of the moral superiority of the English that he thinks that she made this story up that there's no way her husband's English boss could possibly have made this kind of proposal so Within this family, there seems to be this kind of voluntary submission to English cultural standards and to the idea of English superiority. And even like remember, like you know, this is 1969 that the main plot is taking place in, right? So <clears throat> this is 22 years after 
Indian independence, right? Roughly about the length of a generation. But even so, right? We see, like, with it, like in the house, baby Kachama punishes the children if she hears them speaking uh, Malayalam, which is the uh, primary language of uh, Kerala. And interesting thing about Malayalam, and um, take note of this because I think it actually is important when we're thinking about Esta, um, Esta and Rahel and their relationship. What do you notice about the word Malayalam? Try spelling it backwards. Yeah, it's one of the only languages uh, in the uh, in the world, the name of which is a palindrome, right? It's spelled the same backwards and forwards. So this is something you might want to consider as you think about this kind of this weird unity between these two twins, right? That their native language is a language that is a palindrome, right? Same backwards and forwards. Um, and all of the things that they enjoy, all the things that they appreciate, right? Like, so Ch Chaka was always quoting from English and American literary texts, right? Maybe Kachama teaches them, um, you know, stories out of Shakespeare. And what's the movie that they're on their way to see when they get interrupted by the Communist March? Do either of you happen to recall? Is it modern times? What's that? Is it modern times? No, that's, a, that's a, an old Charlie Chaplin movie. Is it? They're on their way to go see The Sound of Music. I have to keep reminding myself that it's not, this is not an old, like, it's not an old, old story. Yeah, I mean this. this yeah, I mean this, this 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 novel was published in 1997. Yeah, so this is. I mean, it's you know maybe it's like 25 years old, so it's not um, it's not new, but uh, yeah, I think it's but it's taking place. And so by 1969, The Sound of Music is a movie that would have been out for a little while, right? So everything that they're getting is sort of distant or secondhand Anglo-American culture. Um, but this is the kind of stuff that they're fascinated by, right? They're very, very much entwined in this Anglo-American cultural matrix and an Anglo-American global capital, which is weirdly ironic um, that this is taking place in the most, in the reddest part of India, right? The most communist part of India. But we started early, um, so we're about out of time. Do either of you have any immediate questions about any of this? All right, so let me give you some guide questions for next time.